everybody to the Podcast Academy's master class here. We're going to be meeting the critics that you see on your screen right now and discussing why podcasting needs them and how to get on their radar. Before I dive too much further into this, I want to welcome you so much to the Podcast Academy. This is what we're all about. We are a thousand strong across the world, although we are heavily located in North America, hence you know, my American accent. If you aren't yet a member, please do consider joining us. Um, TPA members can see all the past recorded um, events like this one. We have tons of events. And if you've heard of the little thing called the Ambies, aka the Oscars of podcasting, as a TPA member, you will get a free submission and also be a part of the voting experience, which is a really great process as I have heard. So anyway, um, if there's any other stuff you would like to learn about, just go to thepodcastacademy.com, thepodcastacademy.com. We like to keep it very simple and on brand here. Here we are on our socials. Please do follow us there. We also try to remind folks of where and when we will be doing events like this. So again, another great reason to join the Podcast Academy. Last but certainly not least, we want to thank our community building sponsor, Wondery, for underwriting this program. Now, you've heard enough from me. I've been Amanda. Now we're going to go on and have an, an awesome discussion. Thank you so much, Ariel, for facilitating this and also being a board member at the Podcast Academy. Look at all these amazing people here at the Podcast Academy. Let me please stop sharing the screen and I will pass the mic, pun intended, to our. Hi. Hi, everybody. Hello, lovely panelists. I'm excited that this panel has finally come together um, for the next 52-ish minutes, we're going to be talking about writing about podcasts, how to get coverage for writing about podcasts, and what, what it means to critique podcasts, and how that all fits into the wider world of podcasting. So without further ado, um, I would love for each of my panelists to introduce themselves, tell me your name, where you're located if you feel comfortable, um, what you tend to write about, and the name of your publication. Let's keep these intros to around 30 seconds, and I promise we will have more information about all of you as we go throughout. Let's start with Imran. Hey, what's up, everybody? My name is Imran, otherwise known as Captain Ron in my newsletter. I run Great Pods, founded that about two and a half years ago. It is the Rotten Tomatoes for podcasts, where we aggregate the lovely writers over here there's snippets and reviews into one spot to help you discover and decide your next podcast listen. I also have a weekly newsletter that goes out every Thursday that uses their critic reviews to uh, recommend those podcasts uh, as well. Located here in sunny Los Angeles, I suppose. Uh, and we also have a SoCal podcast meetup group that happens once a quarter as well. More information on that in the newsletter. Awesome. Thank you. Let's go to Alice. Hey, um, I'm Alice and I'm based in Edinburgh at the moment and I am a staff writer for podcast reviews and um, I kind of focus on listicles. I'm trying to raise listicles out of the bin um, of bad journalism and so I try and basically write mini reviews for lots of different categories um, and I've been doing that for about five years now. That's pretty much it. Awesome. I'm just trying to get links for everybody, but I will do that shortly. Let's go to Shamina. Kia ora, everyone. Um, I'm Shamina. I live in Auckland in New Zealand. Um, I, for the past year or so, I've been freelance writing um, about podcasts. So um, some of you might have read some of my podcast reviews on Stuff, which is one of New Zealand's biggest print publications. Um, and I also talk about podcasts on Radio New Zealand as well. Awesome. And we'll go to Keelan. Hi, I'm Keelan. I write on my own blog called Mentally, a magpie, where I focus mostly on nonfiction and narrative based podcasts. And I've been writing there for about two ish years now. Wow. Awesome. Thank you, everybody, for sharing. Um, my name is Arielle. I am the founder of Earbuds Podcast Collective, a podcast recommendation newsletter that sends a theme and five podcast episodes on that theme. And each week is curated by a different person. I'm also the head of community and content at squadcast.fm. And I do a few other things in the podcast space that I may allude to here, but if you are interested in learning more, you can follow me on Twitter. That's Ari this and that. So 
I want to get into this discussion. Why do we need podcast criticism? Why do we need people writing about podcasts? And I think for that, we'll start off with Imran, who aggregates a lot of podcast reviews through his website, which is Great Pods. So why do we need criticism, Imran? Well, I'll start off with I. I need it because I needed it because I needed to know who and what people were recommending. There's a level of trust and transparency by going to critics because you have them publish. They're obviously publishing their names and their publications. Uh, and so even whether or not you like or dislike what they're writing, at least you know who they are versus an online app tutorial uh, as well. I wanted that recommendation. Um, I, used, I worked at TuneIn Radio for about eight years and part of our editorial team, uh, feedback that we got from users were, who are you? Why should I listen to this? I don't even know who you are. Uh, what, what is your qualification for it? So it kind of stems from all of that combined together. And uh, that's why I think that uh, a critic, criticism is needed. And I'm personally, I'm a fan of movie criticism as well. So it kind of stems over from that. Anyone else like to chime in? Why do we need criticism? And yeah, wh why, why should podcasts receive criticism? I think it's a, for all of us, it's a relatively new. Podcasting uh, has been around for 20 years or so. Um, and, you know, podcast criticism allows us to know what other people are listening to and enjoying, but it also allows creators to potentially get found from other folks. So how does that sit with you all? Well, I think it validates a genre that I think a lot of people don't realize how much work goes into. Um, it also is a very quick, like fast growing genre and fewer people have time to actually listen to podcasts nowadays. Um, not many people are commuting, etc. And they have very high standards these days. And so they want uh, they want somebody to like help them make an informed choice with their time as with any sort of uh, media content. Um, and it just so happens that this is something that so much, so many people are putting really great artistic and creative talent into. And by us writing about it, we actually get to shout out those people and, and sort of validate something that um, a lot of people just think is like, you know, it's about chat shows and true crime, you know? Mm. I yeah, also, I was like, oh, you go, Keelan. Oh, I was going to say, I also think that the critic is kind of, especially in podcasting, is the person that can connect the podcaster with the listener in a way that the language barriers of a full-time audio person and an average human that doesn't spend their time listening to podcasts, they're kind of, it's kind of the connection in between two different kind of language bases because it's a skill to be able to talk about media in a way for both the people who are making the media and for the people who are ingesting the media. Yeah, no, just going off the back of what um, Keelan and Alice said there, that I feel like it just helps people take the genre, uh, take the medium more seriously. Um, it helps it develop and grow um, as just like a, a little industry. It's not just people just making podcasts in their basement. You know, obviously there are lots of people doing that and that's great, but there's also, you know, full in-house teams at big news media publications that have developed over the past you know decade who are creating um really high production value shows and it's really awesome to be able to tell people about those shows and like because there's so many things out there on you know if you scroll on Spotify um or on Apple Podcasts there's just so much stuff to listen to so it helps for us to exist so that people know what to you know what what's the good stuff what's the what are the um, the interesting new things that are happening? It helps, you know, yeah, helps people figure out what to listen to. Yeah, uh, it, look, if there's, there's okay, and podcast index, there's 4 million podcasts, but that could be one episode, sure. There's like 800,000 that are active, fine. 800,000, are we all going to listen to 800,000? No. So piggybacking off of what these guys are saying is that they're able to kind of go through the weeds a little bit, whether it's through a PR list coming in or their own, uh, discovery, but they're able to articulate. I think that's one of the most important things that I find is that they're able to articulate why you should or shouldn't listen to a podcast versus, and I'm not throwing Apple reviews under 
uh, the bus here, but like Apple user reviews, like you see a one star review and it just says, I hate it. Or a five star review that just says, I love it. That doesn't tell me why or why I shouldn't listen to this particular podcast. It could just, and that could be just for a trailer too, by the way. And it's like, wait a second, you're not telling me anything about the podcast. So that's uh, so why I love podcast critics. They're able to articulate that. So let's get into how each of you got started. I think the folks that we have here watching live now and some of the folks who are going to be watching the replay, um, some folks may be looking for coverage for their podcast, but other folks may just be interested in learning how to get started writing. So talk to me a bit about your background and for you, Imran, just how you got started with Great Pods, the idea behind it. Why don't we start with Alice? How did you start writing and why podcasts? Why podcasts? That's a great question. Um, I kind of got into it by accident. To be honest with you, podcasts completely saved my university experience. I got to university coming from a really bad state school in the UK and had no idea what an essay was. I had no idea what, because I did English literature, I had no idea what the Enlightenment was, any, any sort of comprehension of these like bigger movements. Um, so what I discovered to begin with was British radio shows, um, which then led me into podcasting. So anytime I was sitting in a lecture and I had no idea what I was what I was listening to, I would immediately on my commute home, just go straight in and search those terms and come up with five, six, seven free resources that I would just binge listen to, um, sort of panicked <laughs> in my first two years of university. And they completely transformed my experience. I ended up leaving with a fantastic degree um, and genuinely don't think I would have been able to get there if I didn't have um, podcasts in my arsenal. And so having done that, and then also had started my career as, as a writer, I started writing when I was 18. Um, I actually met Jack, who is the uh, founding editor of um, Podcast Review through a mutual friend. And he, for some reason had read some of my work. I don't know how he got a hold of it, um, but he got back in touch a few years later saying, you know, I read your stuff. Um, I'm starting this um, podcast criticism website. And do you want to write, a, you know, a couple of articles for it? And it was, um, it was kind of, uh, I don't know why the podcasting thing stuck. I think it was because it was something that was so outside of my degree, but it was something that I had a kind of latent passion for. Um, and also the perks of having such a, like, an amazing editor and a consistent editor was, was fantastic for my writing career particularly. Um, and I eventually realized that I really liked writing um, sort of generalized lists. And that was not because I didn't enjoy longer reviews. It was just, they were far too similar to the kind of work I'd been doing at university, um, like, you know, researching particular books. And I wanted to do something new. And I think, um, especially with advances in SEO, I was seeing huge gaps for kind of like really genuinely good content um, for listicles. And it's really surprising because like most of our um, lists now rank, you know, like number one for their search terms. And we've never actually done very much SEO work in terms of keywords. It's all just about building like, value for the reader and getting them to really trust the site and that's entirely how pod review has grown and it's actually seeing that happen that's kind of got me hooked on it to be honest um they're also just fun to listen to you get to like get a really good sense of each kind of genre so whether that's like podcasts for writers or, or stuff that i've never you know would never have engaged with otherwise like um my favorite list i ever wrote was um podcasts uh, economic podcasts and I think it's because it pushes you out of your comfort zone. It, it encourages you as a writer to actually talk about things in a like, like a funnier, more dynamic way. Um, and it stops you being lazy, basically. <laughs> and I think that's what's great about podcasting is because you can find out so much information about something that you don't have to dedicate a ton of time to. Like you don't have to do a degree, for example, to learn so much about something different. Um, and also I've met lots of friends in the podcasting world. And I think um, because it is quite a small world and it's really niche, it, it, it does um, it does like look after you and it makes you feel really kind of like part of something that other, I think, areas of criticism um, have never really appealed to me in that kind of way. Let's go to Shamina. How did you get started writing about podcasts? Um, well, I guess like I started... I've always been like the podcast person, you know, like for the past, I don't know, like decade or so, ever since the days of early season of Serial and Radio Lab and, you know, those um, great NPR shows. I've always been really into podcasts and always, you know, friends have always asked for recommendations. And um, about a year ago, I was, um, I feel like this is a very New Zealand story. Um, 
a good friend of mine, George, was writing for stuff, um, writing a weekly column about podcasts, and he was looking to finish up and basically was like, do you want to take over from me? Um, I know you really like podcasts. And yeah, I sent a, sent a column to the editor and he thought it was good enough to publish. And yeah, so <laughs> that's basically, yeah very small media industry in New Zealand I've been a journalist for the past um decade or so so yeah it's um helpful to have though have that smallness to be able to get opportunities like that but um yeah and then same with talking about podcasts and radio New Zealand as well like it's yeah the producer of a of one of the shows needed somebody last minute to fill in she knew who I was I jumped in, she thought I was okay. And so now I talk about podcasts every month on, on Radio New Zealand. Oh, so wow. yeah. That's awesome. Keelan, what about you? I actually wanted to start a bookstagram. Um, a friend of mine from college it has a like nauseatingly successful bookstagram, which is great for her. I love it. I support it. But I was also like, how how what? Um and then I, I love reading. I still love reading. Um, it didn't pan out for me. And so I started thinking, all right, maybe I'll do something with podcasts because I feel like everyone to a certain degree who writes about podcasts that to their people is the podcast person. Um, and then I wrote, I think it was Murder in Illinois was the podcast that I first like reviewed. And then like, eight months or a year after I published it, Imran sent me a message and said, Hey, keep doing this, please. Um, and that's kind of where it went because the pandemic had derailed my writing and everything. And I was like, I don't know what I'm doing. Um, I have a background in theater and Spanish literature. <laughs> um, and it just all kind of flowed from there. Yeah. I've really loved watching your journey. Um, if you go to Keelan's Twitter, I think for a while you had on there podcast critic question mark, and then the question mark got taken away. <laughs> Imran, what about you? How did you get started? Uh, I'll do the quick. I'll try to speak fast on this one because it's a long one. All right. 2009, I started out uh, in LA. I went to USC and then went to uh, KUCI, which is the radio station down in Irvine, uh, college radio. And I did a Bollywood and Bhangra radio uh, station uh, program every Saturday. And I would make that on demand, aka podcast it afterwards uh, every week for about a year. Then I got a job at TuneIn Radio up in the Bay Area, moved up there uh, and worked as a generalist from support all the way to operations and marketing. Uh, and then right after that ended, then I got a job at Himalaya Podcast. Um, if you know about Himalaya Podcast, Google it. There's some exciting stories about it. Uh, that imploded a little bit, but that is the beginning of the pandemic. And in the middle of that, I was like, I'm, I need to do my own thing. I got inspired. I did some discovery as a startup entrepreneurial world. Uh, and that is the, when I was doing the discovery for podcasts and what I wanted to do in the audio space, uh, it was between users and critics. I landed upon uh, the critic user reviews and that's how I started. Uh, I moved back home to LA and started that garage startup. There you go. Awesome. It's been two and a half years. There you go. Love all of the origin stories. Thank you all so much. I'm now curious about how you find podcasts to review and or write about. I know some folks, Alice, you had a really great um, Twitter thread about this um, that we can put into the chat about how you find podcasts, actually how you come up with ideas for lists. But I'm curious about all of you. When you are thinking about writing an article, how, what, what is the, take me from start to finish. Um, and for that. I will start and feel free to include pitches a little bit. So we'll get into this uh, to a certain extent. I think most folks here are curious about how to pitch their own podcast to you. So talk to me about the balance. How do you balance podcasts that you want to review with podcasts that are being pitched to you to review or lists that are being brought to you? Hey, can you make a list on this? So just talk to me a bit about um, idea to article and we can start with um, Shamina. Um, so I think when I first started out, you know, I wasn't on anyone's sort of email lists for, um, press releases or anything like that. So I was kind of finding things 
how I normally would find them. So um, reading other people's reviews. So somebody like Miranda Sawyer from The Guardian, who's been writing about podcasts for years. Um, the Guardian also has a really good um, podcast newsletter that comes out every week. So kind of getting things that way, looking at the Spotify charts, what's new, what people are listening to, um, things that I've listened to in the past, often like seeing new episodes come up in the feed as well, like um, new things that those people are working on or kind of cross promotion, like they're kind of giving a um, taste of an episode of somebody else's podcast and vice versa. So like, I think that, that kind of organic way of finding things. Um, but then as I started to write, um, people um I would contact journalists that I saw you know talking about a podcast that I wanted to listen to and I might ask them if I could get some advanced episodes um but also PR people would start getting in touch with me as well um so that's like actually kind of towards the um you know more recent months I think a lot of the stuff that I was listening to when I was reviewing was through um yeah, press releases I was getting sent from people because it's really good to know, okay, this thing is coming up in a couple of weeks. Um, you know, the first episodes are getting dropped in a couple of weeks. Um, I can give you some advance episodes to listen to. Um, and I really quite like being able to time my reviews with that um, release date um, because I think that's really good for readers to be able to see like, here are the newest things to listen to, especially for people who listen to lots of podcasts. You know, I don't want to be reviewing something that a lot of readers might have already listened to months ago. Um, so yeah, I think being able to get those um, get those new shows from people in advance has definitely been like quite a game changer for me. Um, in terms of like process, you mean like how I go about writing? Is that sort of what, what you mean, Ariel? Yeah, um, feel free to tailor that towards what might be helpful for potential mm. pitchers to to know. Mm. Right. Okay. Yeah. So I think a a pitch that's always really helpful is something with like, tell me what it's about in like the first paragraph. You know, like don't tell me. I don't know. I think um, <sighs> details about maybe like. I mean, I, I guess if it's a really high profile person, I think details about who is behind the podcast is important for, for, for the pitch email. But like, honestly, like what I want to know straight away is like, what is the, um, what is the gist of this show? Because that's going to basically determine whether I'm interested in it or not. Um, so I think like having that summary right at the top is really important and also, yeah, having, like I mentioned, advance episodes to listen to is really, really useful. Um, I don't know about these other guys, but my preference is definitely getting um, a SoundCloud link or maybe like a Google Drive link. Dropbox is like, oh, not great for, I always listen to things on my phone and Dropbox is just really like glitchy. Um, so yeah, I would advise my preference is definitely SoundCloud or um or Google Drive um and yeah and like a press pack as well you know just like a nice good summary of like details that I will need to refer to when I'm writing it um rather than needing to like go back and listen to the episode to figure out those details having those key details about like um who who is hosting it um what are the you know if they're only sending me the first episode then like what's coming up in later episodes um who's behind it all of that sort of stuff like those key details are really useful especially when I'm writing like a 200 word review um yeah hopefully that's, that's kind great. of no, that's yeah great. How, how <laughs> and, I, and I think just a second Imran I, I, I just want to add that um if you are watching this and you're thinking and you're hoping to identify any patterns between what people prefer I would say stop looking for patterns because everybody's going to prefer something different. And that might be frustrating because it means that you have to tailor your pitches to each of these reviewers and the other reviewers who are not being represented here. But it is worth it because your chances of being answered are much higher if you take into account what people actually want to hear from you and the types of assets that they want to receive from you. My favorite thing to do is to pitch 
people before I'm ready to pitch people and ask them how they like to receive pitches. So, hi, my name's Ariel. I'm going to have some news coming soon. What's the best way for me to share it with you? And with that, we'll go to Keelan. What does start to end look like for you? Um, I am not quite sure all the time. <laughs> um, the whole magpie thing of my website is that it's just kind of anything it's almost anything lately. I've been trying to dip a little bit more into audio drama. Um, it's mostly because of my background in theater. I'm trying, I want to slide into that a little bit more. Um, but how to get my attention is to get to know me. Um, I will shout out Mackenzie Freeman, who's here, um, who I get a lot from, but also she's been really great at tailoring things to me and getting a relationship with me um and making it very personable so that it's not just like I feel like I'm getting like I am getting press packs from her but I'm also getting things about like hey you're the our thing has kind of become the Buffalo Bills because I'm a Buffalo native and that relationship and that trust of you actually know me and you're paying attention to what I'm doing rather than just kind of smacking something in an email to get my attention because I, we get a lot and that's great. But at the same time, I, I always joke with my friends, I don't really watch movies. It's just not something I do. So I'm sorry to everyone who's pitched me a movie chat podcast. I will probably not listen to your podcast except for that one episode about the movie I really love. Um, and even then I might not be able to have a relationship with you because I don't have a rep with the rest of your podcast because I don't watch movies. Um, so I like a lot of different things and basically it's kind of what gets my attention. Interesting, curious, weird things. It can be anything. Um, when you're pitching to me, I like to know the length of time I'm going to be committing to listening listening to your podcast. Um, that's really important for me just with scheduling wise. And I have taken a break from doing more release day reviews, but the advanced audio is really, really lovely, especially more than one episode, um, if you can manage it, because that just gives us more. And I think it also helps the readers have more trust in what we're saying. Because if we say, oh, we only got one episode, how are we going to know that the rest of the series might line up with the quality and or the narrative if it all lines up with the first episode? Or are you just putting all of your eggs in the one episode and saying, this is the best? Um, you know, that really, really helps. So I'm kind of a throw spaghetti at the wall type of person. But if I do talk to people and there are patterns and just kind of try and build trust and a personable thing with me. Um, I do have a pitch form on my website. If you don't know necessarily how to do that, it's a place to start. I do look at all of the pitches and a couple of them have gotten two reviews on Ladylike was one of them, um, for example. So throw spaghetti at the wall. We'll see what happens. Awesome. And Imran, I cut you off before. Tell us what you were going to say. What what does it take to get a review posted on Great Pods? And you had a question about time. Yeah. Oh, well, I was just uh, first off, I'll ask with the, the the question first. Is that with the three uh, ladies here that um, the amount of and I think somebody threw it. I think Mackenzie threw it in the chat um, of the QA. But it was something that was on my mind to for for everybody else to express. How long in advance do you want a podcast to come into your inbox? Is it two weeks, a month, two months? I mean, I, for myself, I'll say that um, at least minimum of two weeks. I started a coming soon section on the website. So I'd love to drop it into the coming soon section if you have a new season or a new podcast that is coming out. Um, uh, I do you want to share a bit yeah. about so yeah. how do you get on great pods so the the first and foremost thing about the the criticism if it's written about uh by one of these three or any other publication big or small a blog 
uh, or the New York Times, it doesn't really matter. But if somebody has written something about your podcast uh, and it describes why they should or shouldn't listen to the podcast, then you can send me the link and I will index it onto the website. Um, if listicles are a little tricky, um, if a listicle is just saying regurgitating the description, um, and I read all of them, by the way, so I, I don't consider that a review. But um, since we're still new to adding reviews to the system, I will consider some gray areas when it comes to listicles, as long as they're there, they're, they have an opinion made uh, regarding that. Uh, the other flip side, as I mentioned, is the coming soon section. Uh, I can index it that way. That's new for, for us to, to test out. Uh, the one uh, condition there is that uh, it will be indexed by Google, which will be great. However, it's not searchable onto the website until there is a review. Awesome. Um, and then just to answer your question, Imran, if everybody wants to share their ideal timeline for receiving a pitch, and then if that pitch is a yes, um, how far in advance do you like to know uh, about that podcast? We'll start with Alice. This isn't really my area. I think you should reach out to Kat Rooney. She's, uh, she does our reviews um, on PodReview or just reach out to PodReview itself. Um, we do publish monthly sort of uh, roundups of, of new podcasts that you should be listening to, which I do contribute to sometimes. It's not completely stupid to email me, but like that's not really my area. So I would go to Kat. <laughs> yeah, and I'll, I'll just make clear what Alice means here. So podcast review is a newsletter that goes out. Is it every Thursday or Wednesday, right? Wednesday, yeah. Wednesday. And in it, you'll see a whole bunch of different articles um, and Alice handles listicles, but then there are other folks who cover other things. So definitely subscribe to that newsletter. Subscribe to all of these newsletters. What about you, Shamina? Um, so thing I'm, I'm, I'm reviewing a little bit less these days because I'm not writing for stuff anymore um, as of a couple of weeks ago, but I'm still talking about podcasts on RNZ. So um, yeah, probably couple of weeks usually is 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 good um maybe three or four ideally um but not two months because then I'll probably forget so um yeah a couple of weeks is usually a pretty good timeline for me two weeks what about you Keelan I would say like no more than a month and then if you're dropping me an audio the sooner the better for the audio um if we've gotten to that point, but I'd say like a month to say, Hey, this is coming out and maybe two weeks to say, Hey, I have the audio or I have a cut of something started that I can send to you. That's a really, really great timeline. Awesome. Just a reminder to folks who are watching this live that if you have questions, make sure to put them in the Q and A. And if you don't have questions, but you want questions answered, go into the Q and A and upvote the questions that you definitely want to hear answers for. And with that, I want to talk about the impact. So people who are watching this, people who are listening to this might be thinking, yeah, I would love to get featured. I would love to, to be written about. I would love a review. I would love to have my review aggregated on Great Pods, but what's going to be the impact of it? So I would love to hear from you all about, um, about impact. What should the impact be? What's an ideal situation? And what is, um, what is, what's an ideal and then what is the the general thing that actually does end up happening is it going to cause huge spikes for people or is it more of like uh it's nice you know we got featured now we can use it to build buzz around our show alice go ahead i actually have a really nice story about this there, um i the first listicle i ever did was um best writing podcast and i reviewed a great podcast called the underground writing project which um takes creative writing classes into um disadvantaged communities around the u.s and they wrote to me and they say that almost all their traffic comes from that list. And they went from having, you know, like three listeners to having hundreds of listeners every month. And so, you know, for micro podcasts, it, I think it makes a huge difference. Um, in terms of, I can only speak from what I see from the lists. And that is, um, I mean, you know, there are obviously like a lot of lists that are really terrible. And, and I consider a lot of listicles to be kind of like snakes eating their own tails because a lot of the journalists that write these or the copywriters or whatever are just going by other lists. Um, so they type into Google and they find their answers and they write another list of the 10 best interview chat podcasts and whatever. And so you just get the same information regurgitated and it is just a list of descriptions. Whereas if you actually, you know, do your research and I've illustrated in that thread exactly how I research each, pod each podcast. So if you're interested in 
helping your podcast become more discoverable, I would just go back to that thread. Um, but certainly we've seen um, in terms of like our site, we've grown year on year and that has basically just been from lists and list traffic. And, um, and the difference is that we're actually writing many reviews in each list. So if you would like your show to be in one of those lists, there's a few things that you can do. And that is, we probably won't put your show in that list if you've only got three or four episodes. It's very, very unlikely, um, but please put it on my radar. I will almost certainly be putting um, which list I'm researching on my Twitter. I'm very lonely. I don't tweet about many other things. So if you wanna have a conversation with me, I will probably be available if you can stand the time difference. and. Um, I would just love to know about your show. And if I'm, if it gets on my radar and I start listening to it six months down the line, you could be on a list and that list will stay at the top probably of that search engine for a, a significant amount of time. And we do update lists as well. So if you've seen a list that you're like, wow, this is really hitting all my buttons. It's at the top of whatever, it's best music podcast, best, best food podcast, whatever. Um, I've just launched this show and I wanna be on that list. It's not impossible. We update them every year or so because you have to because it's SEO, but it's also because things move on. So um, yeah, please just engage with me and I will keep my eye on your show. And if I think it's good, it will, it will go on the list. Like I'm not, I'm not precious about, you know, supporting particular shows over other ones. Um, and it doesn't matter how many listeners you have, truly. And I just want to temper expectations that SEO is a long game. So you're not going to get featured and then get t tens of thousands of downloads right away. It might take some time, but that's a really great situation. It doesn't always happen that um, being featured is going to drive tons and tons of downloads. Go ahead, Alice. There's a benefit from being like put on a list that has already existed for a certain amount of time. I will say that. So if you've seen one of our lists and you think, oh, they haven't updated that for about a year, that's probably a great opportunity for you if you are SEO minded um, and you think your show is good enough to be on that list. So just. Yeah, that's a, that's a little secret. So if you're thinking, um, it, a call to action would be to go to podcast review, look at all the lists and see what hasn't been updated for a year. See if your podcast fits into that and go from there. <laughs> Thank you, Alice. What about you, Keelan? Um, my impact is that I want, or at least what I want to do is I want to try and get the person who hasn't listened to a podcast to listen to a podcast. Um, so I'm not necessarily, I mean, I might, no one's reached out to me and to say, hey, your feature has done this, has done that. But I do get um, a lot of bounces back from podcast websites where they do have a snippet of my reviews. So I do know that relationship is happening. Um, but my focus is to bridge the gap between people who don't know why to say, don't know how to say why they think something is good and the podcaster. And that's where I kind of sit. And that's what I want my impact to be for podcasting, the podcaster and the listener. I also have seen a lot of responses to Keelan's reviews of people saying, I don't know how she really hit the nail on the head with what we were trying to do with our show. And I think sometimes even if you're, um, even if a review doesn't drive tons and tons of downloads, it is an opportunity for you to repost it and say, check us out. We're getting press. Check us out. We're getting press means we get to be featured on Great Pods, which is another backlink for your podcast. Lots of opportunities there. Let's go to Shamina. What is the impact or what is the hopeful impact of your reviews? Hmm. Um, so, I mean, it's it's funny because I feel like when I, when I would submit a column or if I'm talking on the radio, it just feels like, you know, sometimes you just think oh it's just me and my mum who are listening it's like you know but actually like hundreds of thousands of people are, are listening or, or, or reading like that's the that is the the reach really with um with mainstream publications or, or, or media um and and so I think that kind of potential impact is 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 obviously huge um and I've got lots of feedback from, you know, from podcasts, from producers or um, hosts or, you know, people seeing that I've reviewed their podcast and thanking me and um, talking about on, on, on Twitter or, or wherever. So it's, um, yeah, it's, yeah, like I said, it's funny because you think like, oh, who, is anyone really reading this? I don't know. Like, I guess so. And then actually like seeing that impact, getting that feedback that like, oh, okay, yes, like people, people definitely are. Um, yeah, it's kind of my, it can feel quite mind boggling than the numbers of people who are actually um, engaging with it, 
because of that reach of those mainstream platforms. So, yeah, I think that's the, hopefully that sort of answers that question. Yeah, absolutely. And Imran, what does it mean to be featured on Grey Pods? What what have yeah. you seen happen? Good and so, bad. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so here's the thing for Great Pods um, and getting featured. It's marketing, 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 marketing. Eighty, and I'll give you some data points uh, on our end. 80% of our traffic comes from Google SEO. That means that they, the users, listeners have been, they've heard about your podcast from somewhere, whether it's from a publication or it's from your pod swaps, whatever marketing tool you've been tiptoeing on and, and doing it and getting, getting that exposure, that's 80% of that traffic is coming through that. Once they're in our system, they visit another page, another one to two more pages to discover other podcasts if they decide to. So that's 80% of our traffic. Now, the impact in the industry-wise, um, as far as the listening number, like download numbers, I don't know uh, if we have an impact as of yet. But 66% of our users have said that Great Pods does help decide on what podcast they should listen to. That's thanks to these, these guys over here. Uh, and the criticism because they're reading through the snippets. Twenty to twenty-five percent of people click through to to read their full reviews. Um, so, so that's that. Those are the overall numbers. You can piece together a storyline with that. But people come in through Google, they read the reviews. Twenty percent of that click through, and we help them decide on that podcast listen. Now, my job as a startup is to also get them engaged and keep them coming back again and again. So that number, uh, the bounce rate just keeps on coming back once a month or something like that. Uh, so that's my goal. Um, and so, yeah, that's that's what I got. Yeah, awesome. Super helpful. I definitely want to answer some questions that we have in the Q&A section. If you have more questions, please feel free to throw them in there. While I start figuring out which questions I want to begin with, I would love to ask each of my panelists right now to find one of the favorite blog posts that they've written and put them into the chat, link us to it so that folks can make sure that they're subscribed and so that we can show off your best work. And while you're doing that, I will begin um, answering or I will begin asking the most upvoted question, which is from Christoph. It says, how do you like to be approached by a podcast looking to gain exposure? What information is important to you when deciding which shows to review? And I think we have gone over some of those elements, but it would be helpful to sort of recap. So I think uh, most folks have mentioned that a link is important, a website is important, um, some information about the show, but what else is standing out to folks? What must be in a pitch to you? And this is for anybody. Please make sure your link is accessible to people in the UK because not all of it is and I have to chase out people. Also, I'm usually going to request an advanced episode if you haven't released yet. So if you have any intention of me actually listening to it, please just send me the advanced episode so I don't have to go back and forth. And what's interesting about what Alice said, um, advanced episodes, a lot of publications will either require or request advanced episodes, but some folks do not have time. <laughs> so for example, I run a podcast recommendation newsletter and a lot of people pitch me to be featured in the newsletter. And I don't have time to listen to all of the people who might want to be featured in the community section of my newsletter. So what I will ask for instead is, can you write me a two to three sentence blurb about your show? And I'll put that blurb in my newsletter and I'm not necessarily going to listen to it. I'm going to audit it a little bit. I'm going to make sure it aligns with my values. But other than that, I'm just happy to celebrate you. So that's another example for you. Other folks, what must be in a pitch to you? Yeah, I'll, I'll say, oh, Keelan, go for it. Oh, I was going to say, um, if it's not just like a press release, please say hello and like what your podcast is about. Um, the amount of things I get that are just kind of a link. And it's like, I that link tells me nothing. Please say hello and give me a link or give me like what you're doing and not just a link. Yeah. Um, Lauren Passell, who writes podcast, the newsletter says, tell me my dress is pretty and I'll do anything for you. And what that means in practicality is like respond to her latest email and tell her that you loved a recommendation that she recommended. And oh, look, I also have a podcast and would love for you to potentially feature it. <laughs> Thank you, Keelan. What about you, Shamina? Um, I think, yeah, going back to some of the things that Keelan was saying before as well, um, like plus one about Mackenzie Freeman, like, honestly, so great. Thank you. <laughs> um, some of, like, I, pre I think I've pretty much reviewed everything that Mackenzie has sent me. <laughs> um, and it's just, yeah, that little like personalization 
at the start kind of makes a difference because you can tell immediately like I'm on this person's list and it's generic versus you know this person is thanking me for my review um that I gave of their um one of their other podcasts and has taken the time to to say that and so it makes me feel more obligated at the start to actually like read what they're saying and but it also makes me more interested as well to see like you know okay I've reviewed one of their things before um and they've read it and they've liked it maybe they've got something else that's good for me um so definitely that and then also another thing that Kidlin said about multiple episodes I think as well like often it's quite hard to get a sense of something in the first episode um so getting a, at least a couple doesn't have to be the whole series I think sometimes that's like if it's a 10 episode series then like it's, it's a lot of listening and I'm a very sort of precise person you know if somebody sent me 10 episodes to potentially listen to and I only listen to half of them then I feel like you know what if I make criticisms of this podcast that they address in the next five whereas if they've only sent me a few then I'm like okay I feel like confident in saying I've listened to a few and here are my critiques but maybe they'll address this stuff later on um yeah and I think maybe something that is going back to what I was saying before like really important to have like what the podcast is about like right at the top and then all of that other detail and in, in a attached press release um or word document or, or, or something so that I can go back to that when I'm actually writing it but like that stuff doesn't need to be in the main body of the email to get me interested in the first place like just tell me what it's about and then you know that that's the real critical distinction about whether I want to listen to it to, to a show or not like tell me what it's about and all the other stuff that that's important later on after I've already listened to it and then want to write about it and if I could hammer home one point from this entire conversation it is that just because Shamina said it just because Keelan said it, just because Imran said it, just because Alice said it doesn't mean it applies to all podcast reviewers or all podcast writers. Ask people how they like to be pitched. Ask people what should go into a pitch individually. I know it takes time, but it is worth it. Uh, with that, I want to ask a few more questions before we have to close it out. I love this question from K.O. Myers. Audio quality is important, of course, but how do you guard against dismissing a show with a great concept or message if they're still figuring out their sound issues? And for the sake of time, I'll just have one person answer this. Alice, would you like to take a stab at that one? Could you repeat the question? I didn't know you were going to come to me. I was typing. <laughs> yes. <laughs> how, how do you go about reviewing a show that their audio quality is not great, but the concept is? Oh, that's such a good question because I actually am friends with podcast producer now. So I'm like, I'm, I've got the, his voice in the back of my head going, no, it's got to be good because there's so much work goes into podcast producing. But I appreciate that, like, the whole point is that it's an accessible medium for everybody to be able to express their content and creativity. And I, I think, like, podcast review really stands by that. Um, we've always kind of operated on the assumption that we are kind of protecting the, the, the listener from the kind of ins and outs of the podcast industry, you know, like the nitty gritty stuff. And we're trying to just, like, filter through that kind of um, politics. So for me, I, as long as I can hear what you're saying and it doesn't it doesn't make me want to instantly turn off listening through your phone. I mean, we think about like the early days of YouTube, we still watched it, do you know what I mean? And no, you know, because quality is so high now, you're going to be compared to those kinds of shows. But if you're starting off, nobody's expecting you to like buy like a $500 microphone, like it's fine. If you've got a good show, then um, it's something that I'd like to hear. And like, talk to me about like, you know, the plans for your show. Like, where do you see it going? Where, where what are your goals? Like, I'm not going to just dismiss out like offhand. It is a factor. I'm not going to lie and say it's not a factor because it is because good production is, is a skill, but you know, I'm not going to say no. Yeah, I would say hard to make hard and fast rules about anything. Anybody want to add to that question? Um, I would like to say that I actively guard about against that because I do try and every once in a while um, and kind of keeping in my rotation, I do intentionally try to add those newer, not as polished podcasts because I believe that like you need to get somewhere to be able to grow sometimes and to find that concept, you can be honest about it and say, hey, they haven't. I think one of my most re more recent was was disastrous history that is coming kind of back. Um, 
I really love the work that he does. You can tell he's doing it at home. There's a, he has a newborn. You heard a, you caught a coup in one of the episodes. And it's one of those things that if you have something that people will like, and you don't sound like you're recording in a tin can, you will get listeners and you will be able to grow from there. And a good reviewer will be able to figure that out as they're listening. Um, And so at least personally, I do guard against that also because my significant other is a professional audio engineer. So I also can make those assessments with more detailed language than maybe someone who doesn't have someone in their life and have the background like I do to be able to kind of mince that a little better. Awesome. Thank you. Let's get to one more question. The question that I would like to uh, focus on is press release question. How does one obtain these phenomenal reviewers email addresses? Does anyone have a list to share or a recommendation for how to begin making that list? And here's what I will say to that. Right now, most of the reviewers have shared their email addresses that are here right now. You have opted in to be at this event, which means you get special access, which is great. Um, other than that, finding email addresses for reviewers is a lot of snooping. It's a lot of trying to figure it out. It's a lot of um, going to their websites. Sometimes it's about DMing them on social media and asking if you can be in touch with them. But again, the um, the question that I mentioned before will get you far, which is how do you like to receive pitches? Hi, I'm DMing you. I'm cold DMing you on Instagram. I'm cold DMing you on Twitter. I'm cold DMing you wherever it is. I noticed that you review podcasts. I happen to have a podcast. I would love to hear what you think about it. What's the best way for me to send you information about it? Can I have your email address? Or asking friends to share, but then it's a delicate balance of making sure that you're not spamming the person that has just now given you permission to email them. Imran, you have your hand up. Uh, I just want to add to what you just said. Um, I have a link. I updated to this actually this morning on uh, a list of people that you can reach out to if you want to get reviewed because throughout the conferences in the last two years, people always ask me how to get reviewed or who to get reviewed from. Made that list last year, updated this morning. Uh, and uh, I think Ko had asked also about uh, you know the genres part of it. I added some of that onto that list as well. I am pasting it here in the chat uh, for everybody to see. And yeah, you can check it out. And it includes newsletters like Lauren's newsletter, Stephen from Podcast Delivery, and Devin from Podstack, who I consider their newsletter to be review worthy. Awesome. Thank you, Imran. Thank you to all my panelists. Thank you to Amanda for setting this up. Thank you to the Podcast Academy. Thank you to the Academy. I've always wanted to say that. Um, I am Ariel Nissenblatt. You can find my work on Twitter, Ari This and That, or you can send me an email, Ariel at earbuds.audio. Would love to hear from you. Would love to hear what you're up to. And I will, with that, hand it off to Amanda. And I know everybody is just wanting 50,000 more hours of everybody's time. I want to thank everybody again, Ariel, Alice, Keelan, Shamina, Imran. Thank you so much. Folks, if you got a lot of this talk, please do give this, give, drop a line to these wonderful critics. They have actually invited you to be in touch. Don't worry, TPA members. I'm going to download that chat so we can like copy and paste that information. As mentioned at the top of this event, we have tons more programming like this. Next up. Think your stuff isn't really appropriate for kids and family? Well, maybe it's not, but either way, it's really helpful to think about audiences who might be sharing the domicile. We all know that there are not enough people out there listening to podcasts. So how and why can you engage those members and those listeners? There are very interesting report that just came out. So we will be briefing that. And if you are not yet a TPA member, what's wrong with you? Just kidding. Nothing's wrong with you. You're great, but you'll be greater if you sign up here. Go to www.thepodcastacademy.com. Join the community. I'm sure Lily, our wonderful community member, or Ariel as well, might drop that link in there for me. Thanks so much. And I will be emailing those of you who are in this room who are not yet a TPA member, to the best of my knowledge, a 50% off discount code. I hope to see you in future events. Please do give us a little bit of feedback if you wish. We always want to make sure that this is helping this wonderful global community of podcasters. I've been Amanda. This has been with the Podcast Academy. Thanks again to everybody. And I will be stopping this webinar at this moment. Thanks for tuning in. And for anybody watching post-talk, hope you're doing well wherever you are, whatever you are. Bye now. <laughs>